What's up, y'all? I'm your host, Lil T, and it's Halloween once again, baby. Woohoo! But this year's gonna look a little different. Apparently, I've reached the age where Halloween is for kids, and the entire gang ditched me. Yeah, apparently, trick or treating is not cool anymore, and I'm okay with that. So I decided to be a good Kirkville citizen and hand out some chocolate to the little gumdrops that are trick-or-treating outside. My parents are gone, so it's just me, a bowl of sweets, and the entire house to myself. Oh, and I'm dressed as Dipper from Gravity Falls because we're both equipped to solve the great mysteries of the world and we're both never hitting six feet. And speaking of my house, you ever notice that when you're alone, your brain just does its own thing? Suddenly every noise is suspicious, like, is that the house setting or my anxiety dropping a mixtape? Which brings me to tonight's topic. Haunted and mysterious video games. Now you may be wondering, Tyson, how did you make that connection? And to that I say, isn't it obvious? Mixtape, Polybius. 1981, when arcades were, um, according to my A's word dictionary, totally tubular. Despite their allure, not everyone was sold on the idea. Kids had nothing better to do than to feed quarters into these electronic boxes, so naturally their parents weren't too thrilled about this. Shocking, I know. And so, rumors started to swirl about the potential side effects of these mesmerizing machines. Migraines, changes in behavior, and according to parents, worsening attention spans. Do I got bad news for you? The US government, never one to ignore a potential problem or opportunity, had already dipped its toes in the arcade world, working with Atari to develop a version of Battlezone for training in the military. It's like I'm really there! But as some would have it, they allegedly had bigger ambitions. They weren't just interested in training soldiers, they were curious whether a game could influence a person's behavior, maybe even brainwash them. And so the legend of Polybius began. According to those who claim to remember, the game appeared quietly in a few arcades in Portland, Oregon. Oregon? Like Gravity Falls? Ba, ba, ba. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, like I said, a few cabinets appeared quietly. There were no bright logos, no colorful designs, just a plain, unmarked black cabinet. It didn't stand out but somehow it drew more attention than anything else in the arcade. Those who played it became utterly captivated, almost as if they couldn't tear themselves away. Polybius research experts, pictured here, had debated for decades on what the gameplay was like, and most agreed that it was similar to Atari's, at the time, popular game, Tempest, which featured sharp vector graphics. But Polybius had something else, something that would set it apart. Subliminal messages, hidden within the game, flashing on the screen without warning, these messages, alongside the addictive gameplay, would worm their way into the subconscious of players, subtly influencing their thoughts and actions. What followed were reports of disturbing effects. Players reported intense migraines, vivid nightmares, and even forgetting how to tie their shoes. In more pressing matters, the game induced violent seizures, or caused lasting psychological harm. In the darkest corners of the story, there are whispers that Polybius drove some to suicidal thoughts, or worse, that it was directly linked to a few deaths. Then, at the end of the day, men in black suits, because of course they're black suits, would reportedly show up to collect data. Then, as mysteriously as it happened, Polybius vanished. The game was pulled from the arcades one month after it debuted without a trace, leaving no physical evidence of its existence. No one's ever found a cabinet, but the stories persist, and to this day, Polybius has never been seen again. Probably. Because when we dig a little further into the story, the details are a little funky. The first known mention of Polybius came in 1998, when a listing for the game appeared on a website called coinop.org, 15 years after it was supposedly haunting Portland arcades. The article even claimed possession of a ROM image file from the 1981 arcade machine and teased a future investigation in Ukraine, though no evidence of this has ever materialized. While the legend may have started here, it really caught fire in 2003 when GamePro magazine ran a feature called Secrets and Lies, introducing the story to a much larger audience and claiming their investigation was inconclusive, which of course fueled public curiosity. Then, in 2006, besides being the birth year of the tea of all littles, a man named Stephen Roche claimed he had worked for a company called Cineslosion. The name, allegedly German for sensory deprivation, sounded about right for a company 
supposedly tasked with developing a game that would mess with players' minds. Rocher claimed the game effects were way more severe than anyone predicted. However, CoinOp.org eventually came out and said that Rocher's story was completely false. But like, this is Polybius we're talking about. Who's to say what's true and what's not? I could say my dog played Polybius and no one would know I was lying except me, because that's impossible. I don't have a dog. The truth is, video games have long been at the center of controversy. I actually did a whole project on it back in grade school. I got an 86% because I guess it wasn't an 87 kind of day. Even as early as 1976, a game called Death Race by Exidy had people clutching their pearls because it allegedly glorified violence. The game involved running over pedestrians, or well, gremlins, but the difference was apparently lost on critics. Naturally, this raised questions about whether video games could influence real life behavior. I mean, people were even saying that Space Invaders had caused a coin shortage in Japan because players were pouring so many 100 yen coins into the machines that the Mint reportedly had to increase production to keep up with demand. Mortal Kombat had parents in a frenzy over its graphic imagery that they thought would sway the minds of the impressionable youth. This was a real thing people were worried about. So by the time the late 90s rolled around, it's no wonder something like the Polybius myth would take off. People were already worried about what harm video games could be causing. The idea that a game could manipulate minds and even drive players to madness wasn't just a wild urban legend, it tapped directly into the real fears people had during the early 80s when Polybius was supposedly around, and also when the rumor got big in 2006. Donkey Kong stabbed someone? Over the years, plenty of people have tried to remake Polybius. There have been Flash games, PC adaptations, and even an Atari 2600 homebrew in 2013, sold at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo with some cheeky subliminal messages. Unfortunately, they weren't deadly. In 2007, Rogue Synapse made a fan version for Windows, inspired by Stephen Roche's claims. To boost its legitimacy, they even registered a Texas company called Cineslosion, supposedly the original game's developer. By 2017, Llamasoft released their own Polybius on PlayStation 4 with VR support, later hitting PC. This game is more like a retelling slash modern adaptation. It's kind of its own thing and is just tributing the original, rather than being a one-to-one -one recreation. Still, no matter how many of these remakes there are, nothing concrete has ever surfaced to prove that the original Polybius was real. Think about it, if a game were causing such extreme reactions, wouldn't the media have jumped on the story? An arcade game reportedly linked to seizures, amnesia, and psychological breakdowns would have made front page news. And honestly, could arcade technology in 1981 even display mind altering subliminal graphics? Today, maybe. But back then, these were what video games looked like. You think they could do that? The legend most likely is derived from some real events that happened in Portland, Oregon in 1981. Two arcade players got sick on the same day, one had a migraine after playing Tempest, and another passed out after a grueling 28-hour Asteroids Marathon. A few days later, the FBI raided several arcades in the area, investigating illegal gambling operations. Agents were reportedly seen monitoring machines for tampering, which likely helped fuel rumors of men in black government-controlled arcade games making people sick. It's also possible that people mixed up Polybius with a few other games. There's Polyplay, a German-made arcade machine with multiple games, which seems to be a popular candidate. The font used for Polyplay even resembles what a lot of fan recreations of Polybius use for the logo. And the fact that Polyplay featured multiple games might explain why no one could ever agree on what Polybius was supposed to be about. Some also confused it with Cube Quest, a 1983 Tempest-like game known for its cutting-edge graphics and constantly breaking down. Due to the unreliable nature of Laserdisc-based video games, they often needed maintenance and were pulled from arcades so frequently that people People likely filled in the gaps with their imaginations and figured out the FBI! Then there's the name Cineslosion, which is little more than a clumsy attempt at German, probably put together with the help of an English to German dictionary. It's made up of the two German words sin, meaning senses, and lotion, meaning to extinguish or to delete. However, the way they're combined isn't how German actually works. A more accurate version would have been Sinlotion, since in German, the possessive ES sound is usually dropped in favor of simpler combinations. That's like a non-native English speaker trying to say mind erasure and instead coming up with erasure of the mind. It's a literal translation that's grammatically correct, but it's overly complex and clunky. Not to mention the fact that sensory deletion is a bit too on the nose to be a legitimate company name, and feels more like someone trying to add an air of authenticity to the myth. And then we come to the MIB. What exactly were they supposed to be collecting from an arcade machine? There wasn't any tech back there to track player reactions, let alone monitor psychological effects. And if the US government was really running some high-risk experiment, why would they choose arcades when anyone, including the media, could walk in and see what's going on? This was peak arcade time. Everyone was there, or at least talking about it. 
It's like trying to tiptoe across the stage at a concert. Not much stealth has happened in there. And then there's the name itself. Polybius comes from an ancient Greek philosopher who famously argued that other historians should not report on things they can't verify. The irony is not lost on me. As it stands, the Polybius legend feels like the perfect storm of urban myth, tapping into a familiar fear of how something as seemingly harmless as a video game might have a darker, more sinister side. Even if the details don't line up, it's that lack of information, those grainy images, and the details from an era that for some was a distant childhood memory, and for others, a decade they weren't even alive to experience. Did Polybius really exist? Probably not. But that hardly matters. The story has outgrown any need for proof, becoming part of gaming lore in its own right. Decades later, we're still fascinated by the possibility that somewhere, just maybe, a game like Polybius could exist, lurking in the shadows, waiting to be rediscovered. Alright, let's dive into a real humpdinger with... Trick or Treaters! There you go. Oh, uh, have a good night now. <laughs> All right. All right. Anyway, let's talk about Berserk, a game that, on the surface, seems like any other classic arcade hit from the 80s. Released in 1980, Berserk puts you in control of a human figure trying to survive maze-like rooms filled with deadly robots. Avoid getting shot, avoid touching the walls, and most importantly, avoid Evil Otto, the smiley-faced villain that chases you relentlessly. Evil Otto can't be killed, and if he touches you, it's game over. But in the early 80s, some people believed it wasn't just your game that ended when Otto caught you, it was supposedly your life. The first story that's often brought up is about a player named Jeff Daly. According to the legend, Jeff was playing Berserk in 1981 when he scored exactly 16,660 points. After entering his initials into the high score list, he collapsed from a heart attack and died right there in the arcade. The ominous 666 in his score didn't exactly help calm people's nerves. Imagine dropping dead while the last thing you see is the little smiley face dude. And just like that, Berserk had a reputation as a killer game. But that's not all. The story continues with another player named Peter Bukowski, who allegedly met the same fate in 1982. The 18-year-old Bukowski walked into Friar Tuck's game room in Calumet City, Illinois, and played a few rounds of Berserk. He even managed to get his initials on the high score list twice that night, but just moments after stepping away from the machine, he collapsed. An ambulance was called, but it was too late. Bukowski was pronounced dead at the hospital. Those are the main two incidents, but there's a third one tied to Berserk that isn't talked about as much. This one involves Edward Clark Jr., who was murdered outside the exact same arcade in 1988 after, yep, you guessed it, playing Berserk. The fact that these deaths, two by heart attack and one by murder, all had ties to the same game and location gave Berserk a dark reputation. A killer game, quite literally. And then eventually, a few individuals finally realized people are gullible. As I was trying to figure out what's really the true story here, I ran into just about every version of it you can imagine. Some sources claim all three deaths are legit and directly tied to Berserk. Others insist none of them happened, or only Bukowski's story is true. It's like the legend has taken on a life of its own, with everyone adding their own twist, making it kinda hard to find the truth. Let's go back to Jeff Daly. His story sounds creepy enough. 16,660 points. 666. Sudden death. However, anyone who's played Berserk will tell you that getting a score of 16,660 doesn't take hours, it takes about 20 minutes. So unless Daly was playing with the urgency of a sloth on vacation, that part doesn't really hold up. Not to mention that 666 is just a spooky addition to spice up the story. But here's the real kicker. Jeff Daly didn't die from playing Berserk. In reality, the name Jeff Daly most likely refers to a man named Jeffrey Allen Daly, who in May of 1981 died in a car accident in Virginia, not from a heart attack in January as the legend claims. This story was first mentioned six months after Peter Bukowski's death in a short-lived magazine called Video Ace, which falsely pulled Daly's name and death into the berserk myth. In reality, Daly had no connection to the game at all. Peter Bukowski's case is a bit different. He really did die after playing Berserk, and it's well documented. 
But while the story likes to paint Berserk as the culprit, the real cause of death was much more mundane and way less supernatural. The coroner found that Bukowski had a pre-existing heart condition, with scar tissue suggesting he'd suffered a previous mild heart attack that went undetected. The stress of the game, as well as walking through the snow to get to the arcade, is likely what triggered the fatal attack. So yes, he did die after playing Berserk, but not because of it. And what about Edward Clark Jr? His murder, while absolutely real and very tragic, had nothing to do with the game itself. It just so happened to take place outside the same arcade where Bukowski died years earlier. Even the game's creator, Alan McNeil, had weighed in on the rumors. He admitted that the Jeff Daly story was completely made up, and confirmed Bukowski's death was the only one linked to the game, but not because of it. The takeaway here is how much misinformation has fueled the Berserk legend. Jeff Daly's death never happened, Peter Bukowski's death, while real, was due to an undiagnosed heart condition, not some curse or evil auto. But arcade player dies from pre-existing health conditions isn't as catchy as game kills player with a high score. And that's the thing, when there's just enough truth mixed with a bit of fiction, people will run with it. Whether it's online forums, old gaming magazine, or your friend's cousin's brother's neighbor who swears it happened, these myths grow big because the supernatural explanation is just way more fun. I mean, I remember how big the Mario 64 personalization stuff was from a few years ago. He was like, finally, now everyone can participate in lying. The truth is, Berserk is just another arcade game with a tough difficulty curve and an obnoxious smiley face guy. But thanks to misreporting, exaggeration, and our collective love of a spooky story, the legend of Berserk as a killer game still hangs around, because nothing sells better than the idea that you could drop dead while playing Pac-Man's Twisted Cousin. Now I can tell you about Doki Doki Literature Club, because trust me, I have a lot to say about it, but you probably know that game's deal already, and it's kind of in a league of its own. Instead, Let's talk about something a little more obscure, but equally as creepy. A lost game that supposedly deletes itself after you play it. In the spring of 1989, a game called Kill Switch was released by an unknown company known as the Carvina Corporation. The game didn't have flashy graphics or an engaging soundtrack. Everything was monochrome and the music was said to be eerie, distorted versions of old Czech folk songs. It was a horror mystery style game, a sort of foreshadowing of Silent Hill. You could choose to play as Porto, a lady trying to escape from a coal mine, or Ghast, who has one of the best looking designs I've ever seen in a video game, yeah he's invisible, and practically made the game unplayable when using him. But that's not why people cared so much about this game. No, no, no. Kill Switch came with a unique twist. Once you finished it, the game deleted itself entirely. No replays, no second chances. This element of self-destruction only fueled players' obsession. People spent weeks, months, maybe even days, trying to crack the game's cryptic puzzles. Especially since Carvina only released 5,000 copies and then vanished into thin air. It was said that nobody ever completed the game as gassed, because playing as an invisible character is, as it turns out, hard. This would be a horrible experience, not being able to see. It's like I'm really there! <laughs> Porto's ability was some form of random growing. She would expand and contract in size throughout the game. Gas was far more powerful than Porto and could actually attack with abilities like fire breath and a poison attack. But again, no one played as him because they couldn't see him. And so it made the game really unfun and most people would just revert back to playing Porto. His self-esteem's gotta be shot. Porto wakes up injured in a coal mine, confused and trying to escape. Along the way, she faces demons, dead foremen, coal golems, and creepy red-coated inspectors from the ominous Sovatic Corporation. There are no bosses to fight, just eerie coal-themed horrors. As she moves through the mine, it's revealed that she was once an investigator looking into the mine's collapse. Players must collect axes, solve complex puzzles, and uncover files and tapes detailing worker abuse by Sovatic, where inspectors would torture coal miners with bladed objects. These inspectors, however, were driven insane by the mysterious and supernatural forces in the mine. Instead of operating smoothly, machines in the mine would randomly crush and mangle workers. The cryptic final puzzle involves Porto ingesting raw coal that was turned into coke to regain control of her body and escape the mine. As she crawls to safety, the screen would go white, and poof, the game deleted itself. All that hard work for, well, nothing.
I skipped prom for this. This of course only added to the game's allure. How could the game just disappear? What was the meaning behind it all? In 1990, and kinda out of nowhere, the Carvina Corporation issued a press release. In it, they described Kill Switch as unrepeatable, unretrievable, and illogical, stating that death in the game mirrored reality, being final and unknowable. The company went on to say that the fates of Porto and her beloved Gast were to remain a mystery. Beloved? Well, that didn't make any sense. Gas wasn't present in Porto's story at all. So that led players to immediately begin scrambling to understand the connection, sparking theories that Gast might have been more than just an invisible character, and might have been perhaps even the fumes that caused Porto's fluctuating size throughout the game. Players theorized that if someone could just make it through Gast levels, despite the character's impossibility to control, they might unlock something hidden in the game's code. However, the few remaining copies had all but disappeared from retail outlets, and even those with the game found that no one, despite their best efforts, ever managed to complete gas levels. So because of this, Kill Switch quickly became a legend. In 2005, a sealed copy reportedly sold for over $700,000 to a man in Tokyo named Yamamoto Ryuchi. He promised to stream his playthrough, but instead, he uploaded a one minute video of himself crying in front of the character selection screen. Naturally, this story went viral, and forums exploded with theories. Was Kill Switch a political critique of Soviet era industrial tactics? Some thought so, pointing to the coal mine setting and the presence of red coated inspectors torturing workers. Others believed it was an elaborate commentary on the nature of death itself. After all, everyone only gets one shot at life. Meow. Show off. But as much as people loved spinning these tales, there was just one thing that it wasn't real. The legend really took off in the early 2010s on 4chan and Reddit in those chain letter creepypasta style formats. It shared the same DNA as some of these other games we've looked at, being mysterious with a dark backstory that supposedly nobody could quite verify. Kill Switch was the creation of Catherine M. Valente, first published in 2007 on the now defunct website InvisibleGames.net, and was later introduced in her 2013 short story collection, The Melancholy of Mecha Girl. Over time, however, people forgot, or just didn't know, that the story was fiction, and it morphed into a piece of gaming folklore. Even the supposed auction where Yamamoto bought his copy, it never happened. There's no record of any $700,000 game sale, and Yamamoto himself is probably as real as Gast. The idea of a game that deletes itself, that can't be shared or experienced again, feels like something more than a game. It feels like a challenge, or even a riddle. But while Kill Switch may have never existed in the real world, its place in gaming lore is cemented. So if you're still hunting for a copy of Kill Switch, you can probably stop. Unless you're really into invisible characters, in which case, I'd recommend a different hobby. And so we've reached the end of our journey through the strange and eerie world of haunted and mysterious video games. From the self-erasing enigma of Kill Switch to the mind-bending subliminal messages of Polybius, these tales, whether grounded in a sliver of reality or spun from pure imagination, remind us just how much we love a good mystery. It's not just the games themselves that capture us, but the unknown elements that spark our curiosity. The real fear comes from what we can't see, what lurks just beyond our understanding. They remind us that the scariest moments often happen when we think we know what's going on, only to sense that something else is quietly waiting just out of view. So as we close out tonight's look at the spooky side of gaming, just remember, sometimes the scariest things aren't the ones that scream for attention. They're the quiet, unexplained moments. The things that knock at your door and leave you wondering what's gonna happen next. I've been your host, Lil T, and have a very happy Halloween.
Oh, um, didn't I give you a piece of candy already? Well, uh, what's one more, right? <laughs> Happy Halloween! <laughs> Bye. Yeah, that was uh, that was weird. Look, man, you're starting to creep me out, okay? How about you just go to another house? Uh... Thank you. I'll, uh... Not this. Gotcha! Dad? It's you? You didn't think I missed out on a good scare, did you? Where's mom? Oh, she's still at Aunt Fern's Halloween party. I just came back to get something we forgot. I got you a special treat. Dad, these are from our house. I bought these. And that's the trick. Got them. All right, all right. You got me. Anyways, I have to get back to the party. You'll have to host it yourself again. I'm sure you'll be fine, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll survive. See you later, boo. And don't eat all the candy at once, okay? Have a good night. Bye, Dad. Bye. Wait, but Dad only had these chocolates he stole from my pile. So... Okay, Dad. This is, uh, getting old. <laughs> 